Let's have a quick discussion about vaping. It seems like there's some stirring controversy over the practice of vaping. And it comes from the basic question, is vaping bad for you and how bad is it? Which to me is a stupid question really. Beyond asserting, will it like melt your face off? Will it cause cancer in 10 years? Will it, you know, like cause your limbs to fall off? Or will it cause, you know, schizophrenia? There, there's a long checklist of will it do X or Y in a relatively short period of time that it pretty immediately passes. Otherwise it would be in the news by now. You know, vaping caused like immediate horrible effects of any kind. A lot of people have been vaping for quite some time now. And yes, this is all technically anecdotal, not quite scientific evidence, but quite frankly, the scientific community itself is being very slow to tackle this issue in a non-partisan, non-biased way. For you see, a lot of the studies that have come out are saying that vaping is harmful, or it is bad, or as bad as smoking almost, in some cases. Or the other studies are generally saying, yes, it is harmful, but not giving a good context into what degree does this harm constitute. Is it the harm of, like, sun exposure on a sunny day at the beach? Or is it harm, like, inhaling smoke? Like, they, without context, their findings are difficult to decipher. And in other studies, we have, yes, they announce a result of it produces lots of formaldehyde, but we're not really going to tell you how we came to this conclusion. We'll tell you some generalized information about the study, but nothing that you could verify. <clears throat> Which... You know what's funny about that? If you can't verify it, the study is garbage. In the scientific community, our peer-reviewed world, basically, of a modern scientific mindset, if you don't give me the information to verify what you're claiming, I can't verify it, which means that I can't review it, which means that what you're talking about is still completely theoretical in my book. The methodology of these studies are also flawed, wherein they say they're studying the exposure of people to vaping, which in a lot of people's eyes who are vaping or know about vaping would constitute that, basically. That's exposure to vaping, as a vapor would do it. But many of the studies use a fumigation method, where they cloud a room with it, and the participants are just breathing in the room, which I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it does not exactly simulate the effects of vaping because it's not like I'm constantly breathing a cloud of this vapor around me for extended periods of time. I will occasionally pull it out do that and then I'm done like until the next time. So it doesn't really seem to me that the fumigation method that I seem to see repeated in, in uh, studies is worth a damn, really. And so I'm left with almost no actual studies or scientific reviews that tackle this problem either with a understandable and defined methodology, a seemingly correct methodology, or not reaching conclusions that seem pretty absurd, like, you know, oh, it has just as much carcinogens as smoking, except we're not going to tell you why or how at all. It just does. So, I think before people want to sit there and tell me, we need to ban this thing, uh, it, it helped me quit smoking, which, for our, in my book, is a victory. Um, uh, sure, this could be not as bad. It could still be bad in its own way, but you know what? It's not as bad as smoking. And then I can quit this over time. This is a little easier to regulate and control. After all, I can go from like having 16 milligrams of nicotine to 12, to 6, to 2, and then to 0 or whatever. All the while I still have this and I'm still doing the thing, but I'm unhooking myself from the nicotine then. And then once that's done, it's just the next step of breaking the sort of habitual fixation on the actual act. And then you're done. And, you know, if nothing else, I'm not getting tar in my lungs. I'm not actually inhaling burning vegetable matter, basically. So I'm not getting the tar buildup. I'm not getting many of the thousands of 
carcinogenic and toxic chemicals that smoking releases simply through the combustion of vegetable matter. Because that's one, one key difference that sort of sets these two methods apart of nicotine consumption is one actually has burning in it, while the other is a vaporization. There's a big difference between inhaling burnt solid particulate and vapor particles. One is a liquid particulate, the other is a solid particulate. And if you want to look at the difference, look at like asbestos and other such solid microparticles and the damage they can do versus liquid particulates, which can cause their own form of harm over time, but are significantly less dangerous. If it's not as bad as smoking, and we can't really define yet how bad it is, so granted that, but if it is not as bad as smoking, it can help you quit smoking, it has a method almost built into it that can help you quit using it over time, is it not overall a victory to at least have people switch over then? Would it not be at least better? So let's say, you know, people still have all the side effects, just not as bad. Okay, so they're getting emphysema later. They're getting it weaker. They're, you know, getting lung cancer at later stages, maybe not as aggressive. They're having the symptoms, but maybe weaker or half-assed, basically. We should measure not everything against, I think, this absolute standard to prevent all harm. We need to stop it completely, but take it in steps. Measure harm reduction. Like, take your harm, reduce it. Continue to reduce it over time through steps until it is nothing. Simply trying to say, we will stop all harm, pretty daunting goddamn task that's basically impossible. Stop this, reduce that, reduce that, let people do something not quite as bad, but break them off this, right? Harm reduction, and really, how can you argue with that? 